time and we will get started. Thank you all for joining us this evening. It's really great to see you all here. Um, we have a, a really interesting discussion for you this evening. Um, I'm Kate Frankfurt, Chief Philanthropy Officer for the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation. And on behalf of Stacy Caldwell, our Chief Executive Officer, I'd like to thank you for joining us for tonight's salon. Tonight, we're gonna to discuss a recap of the 2022 fire season with an attention on the mosquito fire. First, let me tell you a little bit about who we are and the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation. The Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation has been serving our community since 1998, that's almost 25 years. And we connect people and opportunities, generating resources to build a more caring, creative and effective community. So while attracting philanthropic resources is one of our primary areas of focus, without consistent strategy and leadership, money will not go anywhere. And so we pride ourselves in connecting donors to causes they love, supporting nonprofits through grants and training, and connecting community leaders to collaborate on strategy. And we ensure that our grant making and the resources that we attract to our region are aligned and effective. We have a wonderful board of directors passionate about this region and who represent a range of industries and all who are deeply embedded and engaged in our community. We have a growing staff who work tirelessly to support our efforts. A few of us are on the call tonight and we thank you so much for joining us. Nicole, Anne, Caroline, and Therese. Thanks for your amazing support. So community foundations are philanthropic organizations that are dedicated to improving the lives and environment of a particular area. And they play a key role in identifying and addressing the needs of their region and responding with resources and solutions. So beyond grant, make, grant making and scholarships, TTCF has identified three critical issues unique to our community to which we give special attention. And those are family strengthening, workforce housing, and forest health. Each of these initiatives is supported by a group of stakeholders who work together to advise and collectively tackle the challenges that we as a community face. Challenges that require more than one grant or one agency to solve. And over nearly 25 years, we're proud to have developed not only trusted relationships, but also an increased capacity in our region. But now to our forests. This summer, once again, brought devastating wildfire with the mosquito fire burning nearly 77,000 acres and coming within 30 miles of Truckee. As partners in this effort, we know that as a community, we must continue to do all that we can to mitigate the risks to do our part for not if, but when wildfire finally reaches us. Born after four years of deep learning alongside some of the foremost experts in the field, Forest Futures is a bold entrepreneurial and strategic model for how community foundations across the country can take a lead role in confronting the local impacts of climate change. There are three areas of impact, protect communities, reducing fuels, establishing fire breaks, making sure key evacuation routes are clear, and supporting the development and use of technology to keep us informed. The second is build a forest economy. That's funding for workforce development, infrastructure and industry to utilize hazardous forest waste while strengthening the economy in our region. And we're gonna hear more about the impact of the mosquito fire um, on, on the region this evening. Finally, we're gonna to try to accelerate market solutions which is the scaling and speeding of forest management while creating a model that can be replicated in other global mountain communities. We're deploying flexible and nimble capital to fill needs and gaps. We're accelerating projects, permits, and progress with funds that flow into the community as quickly as we can raise them. We're proud to have raised $5.4 million to date, and we have released $2 million of that into the community for critical fuels reduction projects and support for workforce development programs. And we are protecting our community and building a forest economy for our region as we go. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce Nicole Miller, who is our Forest Futures Program Director. Thanks, Kate. And thanks everyone for joining tonight and especially 
to our two speakers who I will introduce shortly. Um, before we jump into our, our speakers joining, I uh, just wanna remind everyone to please keep yourself muted during the presentations and um, the way that we'll manage questions uh, will be through the chat as you have them. So feel free to type your questions into the chat and then staff will be monitoring that chat, recording the questions and we'll address all of the questions after our speakers um, get through what they would like to share with us and then we'll open it up from there as well. Um, so without further delay, I will introduce our two speakers tonight. We have Kyle Jacobson, who's the forest fire management officer for the Tahoe National Forest. And we have Matt Furtado, the Truckee Battalion Chief on the Cal Fire Nevada Yuba Placer Unit. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I'll let Kyle kick it off. <laughs> All right, thanks, Chief. Uh, yeah, my name is Kyle Jacobson. I am the FMO on the Tahoe. I've also uh, been working on the Lake Tahoe Basin uh, for over a decade now, so been local to the area. And I just wanted to bring up a few uh, key points, having been heavily involved in both the Mosquito and the Caldor, and pointing out just some of the differences and, and some of why we saw some of those differences between last year and this year. Um, so fuels conditions were very similar in both of those fires. We were near record highs in the Caldor and in the Mosquito, um, both in our live fuel moistures and our dead fuel moistures. So fuels were extremely receptive to fire. In both of those fires, we saw extreme fire growth over the first couple of days. They both started in extremely difficult areas um, where they were difficult to contain on initial attack. But there were also some major differences between last year and this year that aided in the containment of the mosquito fire. One of those was the weather. Um, the Caldor for multiple weeks um, kind of had large light nighttime burning ability. So large fire runs at night, whereas the mosquito fire after the first few days settled under a heavier inversion, which allowed a cap to stay on the fire. That smoke settled in, didn't get as much uh, radi radiant heat from the sun. So the fuels didn't heat up as much and that helps uh, tamper some of the fire growth. So that inversion layer definitely helps in the weather conditions. Um, like I said, whereas the Caldor continued burning at night and burning rather um, in, with rather extreme fire behavior at night. Another thing we did see was the fire start dates. The Caldor started on August 14th, whereas the Mosquito started on September 6th. So the Caldor was much earlier in the season, um, allowing more time for that fire to continue to burn. Whereas on the Mosquito, a little later in the season, we also had the benefit of seeing a precipitation event extremely early in the fire. So that really helped when that rain event came in, it really um, kind of dampened the fire behavior and gave firefighters the ability to go and do some direct attack in areas where they were planning on having to put some form of indirect line and using an indirect strategy in place. So they were able to make that, um, that containment area a little bit smaller and shrink the fire perimeter overall. So that definitely benefited the mosquito fire as well. Another thing that I wanted to talk about really quickly was resource availability. Um, there was definitely a difference between last year's fire season and this year's fire season. Last year, we had the Dixie fire going when the Caldor started. That was over 5,000 personnel on that, that fire. Firefighters are a finite resource. And so that had a major impact on the availability of firefighters to suppress the Caldor fire. I pulled some uh, quick numbers. Um, nationally, last year we were at PL5, uh, North Ops was also at PL5, which is the preparedness level, which tells you how many firefighters are actually assigned to fires, how many are available, how many fires are going in the area. So it's just a determination of how prepared we are for new starts. Um, whereas this year on the Mosquito Fire, um, nationally we were at preparedness level four, and in Northern California we were at preparedness level three. So we had more availability of resources. Seven days after the fire had started on the Caldor, there were 1,118 personnel on the Caldor, whereas on the Mosquito Fire, seven days after the start, there were 2,400 personnel on the fire. So almost a thousand more people in a one week period were there to be able to um, try and contain the Mosquito Fire versus uh, the, the Caldor Fire. 
And the final point that I wanted to bring up really quickly was the amount of line that had already been constructed on the Mosquito Fire. So there were two large fire scars around the Mosquito Fire, the American Fire and the King Fire. Firefighters were able to utilize those fire, fire, those fire scars as well as the line that had been construct, constructed from those fires to be able to work off of and give them a strategic advantage. Whereas when we look at the Caldor Fire, um, it was burning in an area that had largely been unburned in, in recent history. So there weren't a whole lot of those strategic opportunities um, that firefighters could take advantage of. So those, those two fire scars um, definitely hampered fire growth. When the fire got into, um, say, the American fire, um, the fire basically put itself out. I wouldn't say it, it, it went out, but it allowed to firefighters to have an advantage and an opportunity to contain that fire in a more favorable fuel type. So those were just some of the things that I noted um, having been involved in both of those fires and some of the differences between the two years and some of the advantages we had on the Mosquito. Um, as noted, the Mosquito, um, when we looked at some of the fire behavior models could have gone um, all the way to Truckee, all the way to Tahoe. There was, was the potential for that. The fire behavior predictions did show that was possible, but the weather, um, the resources, some of the line that was already in existence did help firefighters out and just the tremendous firefighting effort of the folks on the ground as well. I do really want to point out um, the tremendous amount of coordination that took place between the Forest Service, CAL FIRE, all of our local government cooperators, and how quickly um, everyone in the area was able to respond, work together, and be efficient in their operations while they were working on the Mosquito Fire. And that, that was all I had to, to get started, and hopefully that uh, gets uh, Matt going and we can keep rolling with some questions from there. Thanks so much, Kyle. Um, go ahead, Matt. All right, so I'll, I'll reiterate a couple of things Kyle spoke on, and he hit, hit every point perfectly. Um, pertaining overall to the 2022 season compared to the year previous, uh, if you remember it, it last year in July, we had a very hot July, we had a hot August, we had a hot September. This year, we had a, actually a significantly cooler July. And so even though those fuel type, those fuels are much more receptive, like uh, Kyle had mentioned, we just had like, some cooler temperatures we were containing with, contending with. And so uh, in August, it was significantly hotter, but with having kind of an average September with that precipitation that assisted with the mosquito um, was very beneficial. So the, we had different weather patterns this summer compared to the previous. Um, I'm going to say almost seven, really. And then uh, what Kyle hit on, and, and it's very uh, imperative, is we, we didn't have competing incidents this summer. And so last year, we had the Tamarack. And then while the Tamarack was in its full swing, we had the Dixie kickoff. And then now the Dixie's in full swing and we had the Caldor kickoff. And we have these competing fires that are competing for resources. It just makes it very difficult. Everything's drawn down. We're pulling resources from everywhere we can, but there's just never enough. And so as those were almost every incident this summer was its own standalone fire, we were able to throw the house at it, whether it's federal resources, state resources, local resources, we threw the house at every fire, and comparatively, as mentioned, the mosquito was 77,000 acres. That's unfortunately a kind of a small fire compared to the last 20 years, and so that's a, that's a pretty significant increase in, or a decrease in, in acres burned. So uh, overall, we sat very well. The, to extrapolate a little bit on the some of the differences between the Caldor and the mosquito, um, as, as Kyle mentioned, the weather for the Caldor, it, the first 14 days of the Caldor were all under red flag conditions. Only the first couple for the Mosquito were, and then with that weather system come in to help, um, we had it get, as he mentioned, those burn scars we were able to utilize. Th those are, you know, they were both in very nasty terrain, um, you know, and all of our canyons running from east to west. Uh, you know, funnel that normal prevailing wind in kind of we have here in Northern California coming from west to east. And those slopes line, and, and even under the uh, best of conditions, the potential for rapid fire growth is significant, which we certainly saw in those first couple of days. But overall, once those resources got in place, again, because that competition for those resources was not there, we were able to make really good progress, at least stifle it to the point where <clears throat> between that and the weather, 
crews could get into some of the most those more remote areas. And then uh, just so everyone's aware, even though the fire was there, the command team was over in Plasheville and Plash, Plash County, El Dorado County, uh, all the crews over here, everything in the TMU, uh, the Tahoe, Cal Fire, we were all planning for what may occur should the fire continue its run. We had trigger points, uh, like say, such as uh, like Hellhole Reservoir, um, a few other identified areas that should it get to that point, that would be our trigger to then activate um, calling for more resources or planning for evacuations or anything of that nature. So there was a tremendous amount of work done on the, the back end and under the radar uh, here on the east side of the crest. Thankfully, we didn't have to utilize any of those trigger points because everyone did a fabulous job on the west side of the slope. The weather helped us out and uh, ultimately it was a, a very much of a success. But just because they were in similar areas, the, the Caldor and the Mosquito were just very different animals to contend with overall for a lot of reasons. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Um, do we have any questions from the audience that we want to get started with? Or should we just jump right into some of the ones we had preloaded? Just give everyone a minute if anyone wants to unmute. Okay. I'm going to go to a question we actually received via email ahead of the event. Um, so we had a, and I don't know if, uh, let's see if this person is on. Um, question, don't see them on, so I'm just going to ask it for them. Um, the question is related to the area between, kind of in the saddle between Alpine Meadows and uh, Palisades or um, Olympic Valley, and uh, right at the border of Granite Chiefs Wilderness area. Um, and this person uh, said they noticed how much flammable materials built up in the forest there, um, and that it could be they they think it you know is it a crossing point where fire could go from the west side over into um, you know the east side of the slope, and then I guess the the follow up question is. Are there plans to address um, fuel loading kind of in that area that either of your agencies are aware of? Um, and, and then a, a further question more generally, have you reviewed possible wildfire entry points to the Tahoe Basin from the Western Sierra? And are there plans to mitigate at those entry points? So uh, I'll, I'll tackle a couple and I'm gonna let Kyle jump in because there are some regarding the, the ground and the fuel. Um, there are different types of ground. There's SRA, which is a state responsibility area, which is Cal Fire's responsibility, and FRA, which is the federal. So whether it's tied to the TMU or the Tahoe, those would be the agencies in direct control. And, and I say just because we're in direct control, I can't go on to state land. And when I say it's a state responsibility area, it's still private land. And so I, I can't go and just start thinning as I see fit on, on the, those areas. Uh, we are working with many different jurisdictions and landowners, fire districts to mitigate uh, some of the, the, the threat of those impacted forests. There is a tremendous amount of grant money that the state uh, is throwing out for uh, some very valid projects. One of them is on the south side of Olympic Valley. Uh, <clears throat> I do know that Palisades does have a, a, a pretty significant uh, fuel reduction program going on their property. I don't know if that's exactly where they're talking about. And then um, it, it, with the, the dynamics of fire, I, I would just throw, say that the, one of the things we've already put out there is to make sure that this spring we validate all the access points from the east side to the west side uh, prior to a significant potential fire activity, just to make sure the roads are clear, accessible, uh, no trees have come down. If there's any grading that needs to occur, occur. Uh, but to say that we would certainly use those as entry points or <clears throat> defensive points, it, it purely depends on the dynamics of the fire. I'll let Kyle take it. Yeah. No, that was great. And uh, I can say that, you know, both the Tahoe and the Lake Tahoe Basin are doing a tremendous amount of fuels work. I can't speak exactly uh, to that location either, but I know on the Lake Tahoe Basin side on the West Shore, there has been quite a bit of fuels work done in and around the communities. 
at, so as the fire, if it were to get to the east side and start coming down that hill, that there are, um, you know, kind of defensible areas above most of those communities. And I know on the Truckee Ranger District in that area, they have been doing quite a bit of fuels reduction work. Like I said, I just can't speak exactly to that one area. It's really hard to predict exactly where a fire is going to decide to go and where to move. The Caldor is a great example. Um, under most fire behavior models, under most conditions, um, a fire is not gonna push through that amount of granite um, in the area that it did and come back down the slope. So it's really hard to say, hey, this is the area it's gonna go because um, Caldor, I would have expected that the 89 corridor, which is a more heavily timbered area, would have been the main funnel into Lake Tahoe instead of kind of coming through the granite. So we have done work to look at um, where fires can potentially move, but that's not necessarily where the fuels reduction work is gonna provide the biggest um, benefit out in the general forest. So we are really focusing our fuels reduction efforts in and around communities in the wildland urban interface. Thanks, Kyle. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go to some more questions we kind of had preloaded here. Um, how long will a fire scar be beneficial in mitigating or help, you know, assisting firefighters um, with future wildfires before vegetation regrowth, you know, becomes fuel again or becomes detrimental? Um, since you guys spoke to the fact that there were some fire scars around the mosquito that were helpful in some way, can you just speak a little bit more to that concept and and what a fire scar around <laughs> a burning fire can actually help do and how long those effects last. Yeah, I'll, I'll kick that one off. Um, it really depends on the severity of the fire and the work that was done after the fire. We've seen fire scars um, be effective as fuel breaks for 20 plus years, but like last year we saw fire scars that were five to seven years old that were no longer effective in, you know, helping us maintain control of a fire because the amount of brush that had come back, the amount of snags in that fire scar were allowing the fire to move through the scar. So it still reduced the, the rate of spread and the flame length in the fire behavior in some of those conditions. Um, but we've used the term high resistance to control because it puts off a lot of heat and is re very receptive to spot fire. So it's it's really hard to put an actual number on how long it's going to be because it really is going to depend on what the landscape looks like after the fire and how much work was done afterwards to mitigate some of those hazards um, that could present themselves after the fire and, and allowing firefighters to get in there. And Matt, I'm not sure if you want to tag in onto that one. Yeah, no, I would I would agree 100%. Um, and it just depends on how the, the, the burnt ground from the previous fire was managed post fire was it replanted was it uh, just whatever it may be and also what fuel type did it what did, was it to start with um i will say what those burn scars oftentimes provide us is uh is usually a typically a, a lesser of the real heavy timber type uh, resource uh, fuels we'd be containing with but we do have the lighter and flashier faster growing fuels but what they can provide more than anything a lot of times is for our aerial resources to be able to make real good uh, penetration in and start setting up their lines just because the uh, they're not contending with that that old canopy uh, that may be resistant to that aerial firefighting. So that, anyway, you slice it, it it's very, just like we were talking about with the access and where the fire may go. It's the dynamics are, are really um, just individually, you know, terrain dependent, weather dependent, fuel dependent. Um, that being said, we do utilize fire history in our area to, to potentially help predict where a fire may run. And so sometimes those close proximity burn scars can at least give us a good idea where the fire may want to go um, for doling out resources and that sort of a thing. So kind of a follow-up to that, since you both spoke to um, the, the post-fire management of previous burns being an important consideration and what actually affects, you know, future fire behavior on a burn scar. I'm curious if you could speak to your agency's um, priorities or perspectives or how much attention is being given to post-fire recovery. Is there, you know, is more funding needed in that area? Is that an area that 
forest futures could, you know, we, we have been doing some focus on Dixie fire recovery and funding there, but um, if you could just speak a little bit to your efforts and focuses related to post fire recovery, then that would maybe help make those burn scars more manageable or more helpful in future fire events. Uh, I'll, I'll take that. I'll start with this one anyway. On, on the state side, uh, if, if it is actual state ground, say it's a state park or uh, something along those lines, and the state's in control, they will typically do the best, do a pretty good effort to maintain it or manage it uh, post post fire to bring it back to the model it was prior. Um, but as I mentioned, all that state responsibility area, that's state, that's private ground, and there may be some funding. There are is some funding to assist those landowners with post fire. I know like with the Dixie right now, that, that is a significant uh, funding source for a lot of people out there. But uh, it, if we're on the state side, it's up to the landowner um, to either reach out or to manage it themselves typically. Yeah, in the federal side, it, it's a little different. Um, with everything, more money is always always beneficial. Um, there's never enough money to do every acre of land, and we really do um, prioritize on our post-fire recovery. It's just the amount of, of funding and resources are spread out amongst all of these large fires. You, you mentioned the Dixie Fire has a, a large recovery effort going on. The Caldor has started on a large recovery effort. Um, for the Mosquito, we did kind of do a, a restoration, and we're bringing in a rapid assessment team to look at sort of the long-term needs for that area and, and what would be beneficial. A lot of times it's it's really determining, you know, where are we going to salvage? Because we know that we aren't going to be able to remove all of the snags, all of the hazard trees um, from every acre of land. So where are we going to show the most benefit and trying to get a good solid assessment of that, as well as the reforestation piece? Um, where are we going to provide a benefit to the landscape for a number of years versus where are areas that we aren't going to be able to follow up with the work um, and we may go plant some trees, but then we might not ever be able to get back into that area again. Um, so trying to really kind of weigh out where we're going to allocate those funds to help restore that landscape um, the best possible. And, and Matt had mentioned, you know, it, a lot of it really does depend on what what comes back. What's the fuel type? With with the, you know, change in temperatures and, and what we're seeing is we're started starting to see you know, some of the, the species start to move up slope, are we going to see a large, you know, growth of, of ceanothus and we're never really going to get the conifers back in to start shading out the brush and really truly restore it to a forested ecosystem. Those might be places where we really prioritize um, getting some planting done and trying to get trees to kind of kickstart the forest again in those areas. Great, thank you guys. I'm gonna to go to a question from a, a participant, Theo, if you wanna yeah. unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hi, thanks for this um, forum, it's really great. Um, I'm wondering about with the mosquito, what the fire severity maps look like, how much of this, you know, is quote unquote good fire and how much is just cindered, um, you know, speaking of how much restoration would have to be done and how it would look in the future. Yeah, so we, we typically use um, two different types of maps to determine that, that severity. Um, we use ravage maps and, and bark maps, and one of them really looks at the soil severity. And the good news there is there is very little high severity um, in the mosquito. So the soil is still relatively intact, which means it will support um, regrowth of all of those native species. The bark map, or uh, sorry, the, the vegetation map, the ravage map, um, tells a slightly different story. There are areas of high severity um, within the fire, mostly during those first few days when it made those more intense runs. They aren't huge areas. Um, it's less than half of the fire perimeter. So compared to some of the other um, fires we've seen the last few years, um, the mosquito is actually looking a lot better than those fires were, but there still is significant acreage um, that we are gonna need to look at doing some work. And it's part of what I mentioned earlier, a lot of it's really gonna come down to where can we show that benefit? Um, where can we get back in? And some of those um, slopes are so steep, so inaccessible. Are we really going to be able to work effectively in there to, to make it valuable to the landscape as a whole and really trying to prioritize where that work is going to take place? So compared to several fires I've been on, um, I'd say the mosquito is in, in good shape. I'm not going to say it's great shape, but compared to some of the others, 
um, that the maps aren't showing as much damage as as could have been possible. Yeah, and, and I'll speak just to the their the state responsibility area uh, in in and around that Greater Forest Hill area because uh, most of the mosquito was on the FRA, uh, and so the the areas in and around Forest Hill. Uh, it's a mix, but as Kyle was saying, those steeper slopes really took a beating, um, as you kind of expect, um, just with the the way the topography can help drive that fire. And so, again, because of the steepness, the remoteness, uh, it's very difficult ground to work on. And so getting resources in there to try and effectively put in the previous fuel model to retain that uh, could be very, very difficult and dangerous work, to be honest. Um, so a lot of those river canyons do come back. There was already a lot of just scrub oak and things that in, down there below Forest Hill. A lot of that will come back just as it, uh, those trees typically don't perish in the fires. They just come back bushier, to be honest. Thanks for that one. Um, I'm going to go to to one I have. Uh, you both spoke to some of the differences uh, from this 2022 season compared to 2021 that are somewhat human related, I guess I'll call it, but, you know, for not talking about weather conditions, but thinking about firefighting resources or, or, you know, human infrastructure related resources that you were mentioning were more available this season because there weren't necessarily as many competing fires happening at the same time. Um, can you speak to uh, I guess, ways or needs <laughs> that your agency has or just elaborate on, you know, ways that we could alleviate the pressure on those firefighting resources when there are competing incidents? Is it just a need for more people, like more firefighters? Is it also a need for more equipment? Um, what are the needs that would alleviate some of that pressure when there are competing incidents? Uh, well, I can tell you, the having worked in government for 30 years um, we, we always need more better equipment we always need more bodies we always need more trained personnel um it, but to, in order to i wouldn't even begin to how explain how big of a number we would need to have all the resources to compete a dick to fight a dixie and a caldor simultaneously on staff at all times you, you'd have a really hard time justifying that expense to be honest um, we don't, but between on the federal side, the local side, the state side, and the out of state uh, resources that we can call in, there may be a, a slight delay. We call it reflex time from the point in time we recognize that we need those resources to the point in time we actually get them working uh, in, here, in, in our area. Uh, but we have very robust systems in place to order those resources in a timely enough fashion and receive them in a timely enough fashion. And, and we may put them to work for three days or we may put them to work for three months. Uh, just depending on what the what the need may be, on, uh, especially on the state side. But uh, the state has invested heavily in a significant amount of additional personnel, uh, additional uh, air resources. They're they're coming from the Air Force. They're probably a couple of years out, but there are a half dozen C one thirties that will be part of Cal Fire's aerial fleet within a couple of years. Hopefully, uh, they're probably again probably at least two years out. Uh, we're ordering, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, four to five additional Black Hawk helicopters. You know, a couple of years ago, we got enough uh, funding to order one Black Hawk aerial firefighting helicopter for every one of our existing bases. Now they're having a reserve fleet and going to be placing some additional uh, bases throughout the state. Uh, so it, it is a continual thing, but it, it's always incremental progress, I'm going to say. Yeah, you you hit it, Matt. I, I will say, uh, I think speaking for the state, federal, and local government agencies, we could always use more people that are interested in firefighting. Um, there, there's always there's always vacancies, and we're always looking for more firefighters. But Matt's right on. Um, federally, we've done the same thing. We have increased our surge aircraft, the number of aviation assets, um, trying to help do this. But the one thing that's really not related to how you can help on a fire but I think is really important to make sure that we touch on one area, the two areas actually, if the communities can really help are that fuels reduction um, prior to having a fire, um, being instrumental, being supportive, being part of that planning process, um, helping do fundraising for all of those activities. And the second is really prevention of fire starts. The number of fire starts lead to the number of fires and that's people just being good stewards of the land 
paying attention to the campfire restrictions, um, any burn bans that are in effect on the state side or the federal side, um, helping teach your neighbors, the visitors to the area about properly using the land and, and the risks of, of some of those fires in those areas. A lot of our fires are still human caused. Um, the Tahoe Forest, for example, had several, I mean, I think it's probably 20 plus fires this year that were all just campfire starts where people had left you know, their campfire ring. Some of them thought they had extinguished it. Some of them didn't really care either way and just walked away. And those can all lead to fire starts, especially when we have large fires and there's competition for resources. Um, that's pulling resources away to deal with people just being careless in the woods. So I just really wanna say prevention is one of those main areas that everybody in the community can help. Thanks, Kyle. Um, there's a question just put in the chat. I'll, Diane, do you wanna unmute yourself and, and read it off? Okay, I'll read it. Um, how much post-fire logging is being done on the Mosquito and Caldor fires? And should we be looking more at reestablishing our timber industry to help with fuel reduction as an economic resource? I'm gonna let Kyle take this one. Yeah, I'll, I'll hop in that on that one. Um, so I, I see, it depends on how you wanna look at it. Cause a lot of this, a lot of timber, depending on how quickly you get to it, um, becomes unmerchantable material because of the decline in quality. So you have a less than five year period where there's some value in the wood. Um, do I think we need to invest more heavily in um, operations that can help support those industries? Yes, 100%. Um, more biomass. Uh, there's a lot of biomass coming off of forests. Having areas that could take that biomass closer, make it more economically feasible for some of the fuels reduction treatment, as well as the post-fire restoration work that's going on would be valuable um, in the area. I'm not going to not gonna say large mills are, are what we need, um, but we do need to look at the types of industry that could be valuable in helping remove material before the fire and, and after the fire. A lot of what's going on, a lot of what's happened on the Caldor and the Mosquito to date has really been focused on the hazard tree removal and making sure that the roadways um, are safe and accessible to the communities. And then as we get further and further into the restoration efforts, we'll look at more of that those salvage efforts to be able to replant areas and help restore the landscape. But but right now it's mostly been focused on those immediate hazards to the, the communities and the infrastructure. Did you want to add anything, Matt, or should I move on to the next one? Uh, no, I, well, I, the only thing I'd add is again, on state lands, they have the ability to log and things of that nature. They are foresters. I know if it's private land, but it's got state regulated oversight. Um, they do so do some expedited uh, logging activities. Uh, I am not a forester by trade. Uh, I do know that there are those programs out there, uh, and, I'm, and I'm sure it does transpire. But um, as far as uh, the promotion of that, I, we, I need to hit up one of my foresters to give you a, an adequate answer on that one. Thanks. Um, let's see. I'm going to go to a question from one of my colleagues, actually. Kate, do you want to unmute yourself and, act and ask it? Put me on the spot there. <laughs> um, sure. I, I have a question that um, I've been asked, and so I just wanted to put it to the group. Um, is there uh, an increased risk to this area because the Caldor fire and the Dixie fire um, basically kind of you know surrounded us on on different ends last year and then we had the mosquito fire come in now and some of the questions I get asked is you know the the unburned area seems to be us does that put us at at greater risk for the upcoming fire season um, given so much of the fuel around us has already been um, burned uh, you know I'll, I'll start with this one I uh, even though the Caldor ran into South Lake Tahoe and the Dixie was north of us, um, that is an amazingly significantly large area you're talking about of unburnt fuel. Um, from South Lake Tahoe to, I'm going to say Quincy, is a very long way. Um, that being said, you know, no one thought that the a fire would run. If the Caldor was historic for us because it 
crossed the Great Granite Fuel Break, which had never failed us up until then. Uh, the Dixie ran from Eastern Butte County to the top of Lassen County. Um, you know, I, I don't get into um, uh, climate change debates with people, to be honest. Um, but I will say that something obviously has changed starting in 2015. We just started having significantly larger, more rapid growth uh, and, and, and higher loss of, of infrastructure and homes, whether it's that because we've you know approved for people to build out in the middle of nowhere where they previously weren't. And there may be a tremendous amount of factors that come into play for all of this. But um, anyway, slice at it, what, what Kyle was talking previously regarding the fuel reduction efforts, you know, I always tell people there's there's three primary drivers. The, for your first day being a firefighter, you learn about fuel, topography, and weather. And those are the three primary things that drive the fire. There's nothing we can do about topography. There's nothing we can do about the weather. The fuel is the only thing that we have any amount of control over. And so if everyone can continue on that fuel reduction effort, uh, creating those access and egress points that center and have good fuel reduction along those pathways, uh, doing everyone's effort to protect their home and not and realize that the privacy screening you have between you and your neighbor, maybe that needs to go. And that could be a massive contributor to a fire for homes that were within proximity of each other. Uh, because once you get the house to house transmission going, that is an unbelievable difficult thing to deal with. Uh, 2015, like I said, I witnessed it firsthand. I, I wasn't fighting a forest fire. I was fighting city block, block after block after block fire in downtown Middletown in Lake County. Um, the campfire, you know, most of us were there. We all went there early and it was just, there was nothing you could do. There was no, there was very little firefighting going on because there's no way to put a dent in that once that kind of BTU value and those uh, homes start going transmissioning to each other. It, it's just, it's, it's, you're fully transitioned into rescue and life saving mode at that point. And so uh, if we can alleviate that and keep the forest fire on the forest floor, ideally to a lower intensity until the resources can get into place to fight it, that's such a huge factor. Um, so to, I mean, I, I know I kind of broadly answered regarding that huge chunk of ground, but um, we're going to have a thousand little fires in that same stretch of ground before we have one that encompasses the whole thing, hopefully. And ideally, those will just be our bread and butter everyday fires. We can just throw the house at every time they stay between. Most people don't have any idea that we run almost a fire every single day somewhere here in my battalion. And we, you know, Cal Fire's goal is to keep every fire under 10 acres. And 98% of the time we, have, we accomplish that goal. Um, and the, the fires never make the news and that's all fine. It's just the big ones that obviously get away from us. So, um, but that fuel reduction work that everyone can continue on, whatever it may be through grant funding or just personal uh, uh, stewardship of land of their own, that they're in control of, that, that should be the, uh, the forefront of everyone's mind. You wanna add anything, Kyle? Yeah, I, I agree with Matt 100%. Um, yeah, saying that we're at a greater risk, it's it's a large area. We're always at risk and we're always going to be at risk and we need to do what we can to protect the green forest that we have left and, you know, basically focus our efforts on that. Obviously, there's restoration work and rehabilitation work on some of these large fires that need to occur, but we can't focus our attention solely on restoring the fires we have had. Um, we need to place a primary focus on, on keeping the green forest green, the stuff that we still have left. Great, thanks. Um, I have one more question here, and then if anyone else in the audience has one, um, we do have a little bit of time left, but I'll go to this one for now, see if anyone else comes up with one. Um, you both spoke to, with the mosquito fire, kind of compared to the Caldor or the Dixie, you know, the, the big differences were weather, less competing incidents. Um, is that, was that kind of the case across the state? This, if you can speak to this, was that a similar situation across the state with most of the fires we saw that there was just less competing incidents at the same time due to weather, you know, weather conditions statewide, or was it unique to our area that that was the differences? So I'll just say real quickly, uh, the weather helped in the global sense of things, uh, but all of our significant incidents, whether um, was it the Electrifier, I think we had. Uh, July-ish, somewhere in there, 
obviously the mosquito prior to that Kyle can help me out when the six rivers was going I think it was August maybe uh, but they were all basically wrapped up before, before the next one hit and so everyone is able to restock reset rest their personnel and again and we, we were able to throw the house at every new fire yeah and, and Matt's right on I mean and that's the thing so California had a relatively quiet season However, the Southwest was extremely busy. Um, that fire season, luckily, is a little bit earlier than ours. Um, but, you know, California sent a lot of resources out to help the, how, help the Southwest out. Luckily, all those resources got back before California fire season really kicked in. Had that extended, there might have been a commitment of additional resources elsewhere in the nation. But um, Matt hit it. It was, it was relatively quiet throughout California this year, a few large fires, but not really um, multiple fires going on at the same point in time. And not a fire, at least of the magnitude of of the Dixie or the Mendocino complex, where you have 5,000 firefighters on a, a single fire that can really place a huge draw on the capacity quickly. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, I'll give just a, another minute for anyone to Unmute themselves from the audience if you have any further questions. Um, and if not, we will, I think, start to wrap up. Well, I there's see. for me. I'm happy. Oh, go ahead, the other person. Go ahead, Theo. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just want to preface this. Um, I'm not constrained by, in my imagination so much, because I'm not a professional firefighter. I haven't been doing this for 30 years. Um, so I'm wondering, it seems like, from what I've been listening and reading, that mechanical and hand treatments can't really keep pace with this problem. It's just too big of a scale and there's a lot of planning constraints and labor. I'm wondering, do you feel frustration or do you have hopes that we can do more uh, burns that are on prescription, maybe with a wider prescription or burns that uh, where we can allow spring burns or late fall burns if the conditions are right to burn more? Um, or do you think the private property landscape is just too constraining on that with lawsuits to the state and the feds? So it's a loaded question there, Theo. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on, on the Cal Fire side, we always have plans to try to have prescribed burns, but we also have very tight parameters to how those um, can be applied. And the same goes federally. Um, as far as the, the, we have to literally write a prescription uh, and stay with that prescription to have that burn. And to be honest, so we, to put it in perspective, we had 60 acres ready to burn out of Burton Creek uh, this fall. And the problem is that we, we went straight from just about having the conditions we needed to having snow on the ground. And so, you know, it kind of killed us. We're going to certainly shoot for that this uh, this spring. And if nothing else, next fall. But you mentioned about the constraints as far as planning and things for uh, uh, mechanical and hand thinning. Uh, it is, in my opinion, almost nothing compared to the constraints and the planning and the time it takes to get a prescribed fire uh, pushed through on our end. Um, so again, it's also state ground versus private ground. There's only so much we, we are actually in control of, but the state actually has been pushing uh, for private landowners to have uh, more active and a more active role in those vegetation management burns. Um, and UC Davis and those cooperators have been working on that for years now. Um, so there, there, are, there are resources available to landowners to accomplish those missions uh, where they can actually hire private companies to come and do that burning these days. And, and we are in open burning. People can go out if, as long as they are competent, they can go out and, and work on doing prescribed burns on their own land. As long as it's a burn day and they're within a burn and vegetated material from that land and if they don't lose control of the fire. That's the way the laws are set up currently. Yeah, um, I think Matt hit that first part on, on the prescriptions. I don't think there's really anything we can do to uh, to widen those prescriptions so that we can allow more burns. I think that what we have the ability to do is do more burning within the conditions where we feel that we can have successful outcomes. I know federally, um, a bunch of a bunch of additional funding has been focused on fuels reduction, um, both hand thinning, mechanical thinning, and prescribed fire. Um, on the Tahoe, there's the North Yuba Landscape Project, which is one of the chief's um, priority landscapes 
and that's across the entire nation. So there's funding additionally focused for that. And that as an agency, we are looking at how we can expand our fuels capacity um, through personnel, through equipment and what we can do and potentially streamlining some of our planning processes I don't think we're going to be able to change burn plans to change our, our weather parameters, but are there things we can do within the NEPA and CEQA processes to make that planning go a little bit faster so we can get projects on the ground and implemented more quickly than we were traditionally seeing? So there's there's kind of two parts of that, and I think that's where I'm at. Thank you guys for that. Uh, and I know we've seen some prescribed burning happening in the Tahoe and Truckee region recently with the more favorable weather conditions. So um, hopefully that can continue for a little while. We'll see if we get more snow soon. Are there any other questions from the audience? Give it a second. Um, unmute yourself and cut me off while I kind of say a couple more things here if you do want to ask a question. But I think um, first of all, thank you guys so much. I, that was a, a very engaging and interesting discussion, and um, it's great to hear from both of your agencies after the fire season. We did this kind of recap of the fire season as well last fall, and I think it's it's just a really great learning experience for our community, so we really appreciate your time. Um, one of the points I think you both made um, was about you know, community level and landowner level um, responsibility as, as much as po people are able to, you know, do their own defensible space or if they own, you know, a larger size property doing their own prescribed burn or fuel reduction work. And so I just wanted to, for the participants on the call, list out a couple of programs to access those resources. We've done um, webinars on a lot of these programs in the past, but just to put a plug into people's ears if you own a home or own a piece of property that might need some work. Um, the Placer Resource Conservation District for Placer County residents does have a prescribed burn association and they do provide assistance with implementing prescribed burns on your own private property if you are a Placer County private property owner. Um, the Nevada County Fire Safe Council also provides um, financial assistance for hazard tree removal and defensible space if you're a Nevada County resident. If you live within the Truckee Fire Protection District, we have Measure T funding, which is going to be distributed in the coming year for defensible space financial assistance. And then the, the Community Foundation, our, ourselves, the Forest Futures Program, is rolling out our Truckee North Tahoe forest management program, um, releasing our first round of funding and te technical assistance resources this spring for private property owners, three acres or larger across really what we consider the whole North Tahoe Truckee region, um, both counties, um, pretty much uh, north almost to Sierraville, down to Emerald Bay, we'll be um, rolling out a grant funding and technical assistance program for private property owners to do fuel reduction work on their lands. So there are a lot of resources coming out to assist private property owners and would just encourage everyone on this call, if, if you're in a position to potentially access those resources, feel free to reach out to us at the Community Foundation. If you need more information, we can connect you um, to our program or to any of those other programs that I mentioned um, to help you implement on your own property or your own home. Um, and I see a comment. Oh yeah, Nevada County is also within a local burn cooperative, the Yuba Bear, which has equipment expertise and labor resources. So if you're a Nevada County resident, you could also potentially get support for some prescribed burn on private property there too. Um, so again, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us and we can point you in the right direction depending on where your property is located. Um, and a, a big thank you again to our speakers and I'm gonna hand it back over to Kate to wrap us up. Great, thank you, Nicole. And thank you to Kyle and Matt. We really are grateful for your time and for all you're doing. And thank you everybody uh, for joining us tonight. Um, we have a feedback survey that we're gonna link in the chat and you'll receive an email in the coming days with a link to a recording of tonight's discussion. Um, and that's also gonna be available on the TTCF website and our YouTube channel. Um, I hope you'll learn that you will choose to learn more about Forest Futures by going to our website or reaching out directly, um, perhaps supporting these efforts with your year-end philanthropy. We're not gonna have a salon in December um, and we wanna thank you uh, for spending 2021 with us. Um, we see a lot of folks who show up every month 
and we're really glad uh, to know that this um, is making a difference in the community, that you find this valuable. Um, and again, the link in the, the feedback survey in the, in the chat will allow you to give us some more feedback as we plan our 2022, sorry, 2023, boy, I lost a year there, um, our 2023 um, schedule. And so happy holidays in advance to everybody and um, good night. <laughs>